gifted people. Kimmy, thank you for being here with me. It's a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So because your work is all about intensity and sensitivity, I'd love to just kind of start there with you. Can you talk about what you mean when you talk about intense people, emotionally intense people, and maybe how that's different from highly sensitive people, if, that, if it is at all? Oh, such a good question. Thank you for starting with that. Yes, I think a lot of people are confused. Obviously, the word highly sensitive has been around since um, Dr. Elaine Aaron coined it. And most many people, probably audience of your summit, are quite familiar with that. I used the word intensity. It's slightly different. Um, I think, you know, say in the original highly sensitive HSP, let's call it, concept, Sensitive people are usually described as being easily startled. You know, they are they advised to prioritize self care. I think people often get the impression that they are kind of sensitive and vulnerable, like need to protect themselves. But I think the word intensity comes with a bit more passion and vigor. Um, I think Dr. Elaine Aaron covers. Obviously, the two concepts do overlap. I think Dr. Elaine Karen covers the physical and emotional aspects of being intense very, very well. But to me, intensity also has, this, has an intellectual intensity to it and a spiritual dimension, which I don't think were addressed enough for me in the original HSP concept. If anything, I think intensity is closer to another concept known as overexcitabilities which is usually used in the realm of talking about giftedness. But then if I use the word giftedness, people then get the wrong idea of, oh my God, that means I'm superior, it only applies to children. So I also don't use the word gifted very much, but overexcitabilities have got all these dimensions, which you know I'm probably not going to go into now, but people can certainly look it up. And I defined, I have this on my website, I define intensity with five major areas. Um, so these areas are, I'll just probably quickly talk through them without going into lots of details, you know, emotional depth and passion, deep empathy and sensitivity, which overlaps a lot with HSP concept. Um, they are highly perceptive, they have rich in the world and very strong, vivid imagination, and they have strong creative potential, although that also means on the downside, they have quite a bit of existential angst to them um i mean emotional depth and passion means you feel things very very deeply you might be called an old soul and that is both, po both positive and negative you know just get sucked into things and feel very very deeply and that could be quite lonely because even from a young age people might realize that oh only i feel so strongly about something people around me don't seem to so there's that. So maybe from a young age, they already ask themselves the question, why do I feel so much? Why am I too much? You know, that, that. But then obviously there's also the high aspect where when moved by a piece of music or art, they get really taken away and absorbed. Um, so there's that. And they're also very sensitive, emotionally sensitive, very empathic, very sensitive to other people's changes in emotions, moods, and other people's needs. Um, another overlapping concept is that of boundaries. So not boundaries as in like weak boundaries as we often talk about it, but they have very thin energetic boundaries, meaning they go into the world and they feel very porous, like things get to them. Mm. So they're very sensitive to the environment. Like I'm very sensitive. I always wear earplugs and, you know, tags got cut off that kind of thing yeah and they, but then they also very perceptive which is point number three where they feel let's say they walk into the room they can read the air they're very perceptive they can sense it when someone is upset even when the other person doesn't admit it they can often read hypocrisy and lies yeah and they also have a rich inner world they're very imaginative if they didn't have a happy childhood, it's quite common for highly intense people to escape into a fantasy world of fiction and books and TV programs. I mean, these days, probably more like computer games. And yeah, I mean, I'm so old. <laughs> um, yeah, 
the thing is that they might be drawn to spirituality from a young age and even if they don't have a religious background they may feel quite connected to say nature or something bigger than themselves and usually intense people have strong creative potential but then that also means they can get into what I call existential crisis a lot. But they always feel like there's something they've got to be doing. They feel guilty if they're not moving fast enough, if they are just relaxing. It's this weight on the shoulder to solve the world's problems, which is related to very often a family role they then drop into playing, which is that of the family rescuer. But, you know, that's a separate issue. But they do often struggle with things like the artist's block, the writer's block, and procrastinations and that kind of things. It's a beautiful overview. And as you're describing it, I'm thinking, check, 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 check. I check all those boxes. And I'm imagining many of the people listening to our conversation would resonate also, right? You know, um, a summit like this where we're talking about sensitivity and being an empath and being intuitive, we are generally more intense people, especially those of us who are looking to learn more and integrate mm. these aspects of ourselves, right? Mm. So. Um, you know, when I think about how you're describing it, you 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 beautifully kind of shared some of like the upsides, some of the benefits, and some of the potential pitfalls. And so I'm curious for you working in this field, what are some of the challenges that people come to you with as intense people? Like what are what problems are you helping them solve? How are you helping them navigate? these aspects of themselves into into um like their their purpose for being into their work as intense people they there forever <laughs> oh obviously this is what i do for a living so that's all i deal with but adding on to that and probably related to this question you asked me what's the difference between the hsp concept um I think what is not talked about in the original concept, I mean, they probably do now, but originally, or maybe I haven't been exposed to it. There's this sense that you that people need to lower the degree of stimulation to be physically and emotionally protected. But the way I see it, intense people, yes, obviously they can get overstimulated. Like I said, you know, well, I personally get stimulated too much by loud noises, strong smell. I always complain about people's perfume, even I do use them myself. Um, you know, just rough surface, things like a bath. The intense people can also very easily get understimulated. I talk about burnout and bore out. So, you know, being understimulated, especially intellectually, can also make an intense person quite depressed and unhealthy. Yeah, so that is another dimension that makes a difference. So that's a challenge I help people deal with, which is like, how do you find that sweet spot where you are engaged, stimulated enough, and not bored, but then also not overly stimulated where you're overwhelmed. That is so, so hard because a lot of intense people are also perfectionist and they're overly responsible. They feel like they need to be solving everyone's problems. Um that and um, and that is not just a work thing often it comes into relationship as well so people would describe their partner as being they they often feel very guilty saying it but sometimes people find that oh their partner are under engaging in in certain aspects maybe their partner is really really good in running life tasks together but then spiritually it's just like mismatch and it's not one is superior, inferior, it's not that, it's just different. And their partner might be intellectually way superior to them, but then spiritually very shut down or emotionally just don't have the language. So there's that. Um, so going back to the challenges, I think emotional regulation is one. I started my career as a psychotherapist. So that's one thing where I started working with people on the very beginning, which is in learning how to deal with your intense emotions and mood swings, especially when you were younger. I think younger people really struggle with that. I mean, neuroscience has now told us that our prefrontal cortex literally were not formed properly when we were younger. I could resonate with that when I was younger. Everything felt like a huge roller coaster because they are so sensitive to all sorts of stimulants and external output, uh, sorry, external input. So it's really challenging for them to regulate their emotions. Um, 
loneliness because they feel, well, there are many reasons for it. They don't feel like they fit in. They feel very different, but they don't know why. But the intensity also leads to loneliness because I'm feeling these things. The other person, I don't know. We're watching the same film. Why am I the only one who feels so much and cries so much? And you know, um, sensory overstimulation, how to manage that in the real world and not be so criticized and misunderstood. Perfectionism is a big one. I think many intense people I work with have a strong desire for perfection in everything. The work, who they are, which paradoxically leads to things like procrastination, anxiety, imposter syndrome, social anxiety, because they want to make sure they are doing the right thing when actually there is no right thing. Um, yeah, being seen or being caught as too much, which makes them internalize a lot of shame, so they walk around the world wondering if there's something wrong with them. I call it the wounds of being too much, which I talk about quite a lot. Yeah, executive functioning. Now, that's not everyone, uh, but some people mm, really struggle with task switching because there's so many things they want to do, ideas of jumping here, there, back and forth. It doesn't necessarily mean they have ADHD. They just have a very fast brain and the existing system may not cater to them. So when there is a mismatch between the environment and their brain, there could be lots of functioning issues. Impulsivity is related to that. See, I call it impulsivity is already quite negative. Like it's always like, oh, you're impulsive. And actually they're just fast and they probably make intuitive decisions very quickly. And other people see it as impulsive when actually their brain has already gone through a process of discernment and they know what they're doing. So there's that. This mismatch causes a lot of self-doubt as well. Um, burnout, like I said earlier. Yeah, so there are more, but I think these are some of the main themes. Yeah, I can, I as again, as you're describing all of these difficulties that intense people might face, I'm thinking, yes, they all sound familiar. Um, you know, I personally may or may not have experienced all of them, but they certainly sound like, what I hear from sensitive, intense people, the challenges that they deal with. And um, I think you did a really beautiful job of explaining why we have these challenges. And, and if we can even just sort of step back and think about, for example, perfectionism, um, and thinking about how it can lead to this paradox of procrastination or anxiety, that just giving it a little bit of space and looking at it, that it can almost soften it to some degree. And so yeah. I wonder about the work that you do with emotionally intense people. How do you help them soften these challenges? Are there are there certain strategies that you use? Do you just help them kind of um, reframe how they're thinking about things? Or do you actually use certain modalities to help them shift it? What What's your experience been? Oh, there's so much I, so much I can say about that. But adding, adding to that, what we, the, the, the question you just asked. A lot of the problems actually cause, are caused by attempts to solve the original problems. So the things get layered on, like, okay, you, you're different, you feel different, you feel internalized shame, and then in defense of the shame, you become avoidant or you, you, you overly self-soothe, and then it just gets more and more complicated like that. Yeah, so there's that. So it's about untangling it to, to the roots of it. I don't like talking, I mean, yeah, there are, but I really don't quite, sometimes I don't like talking just about strategies and things. I often tell clients I really don't do things like cognitive behavioral therapy. They like to know that there is a protocol, but I don't actually have like a rigid, like, okay, let's do this exercise and then you'll be done. Um, because I really believe in an organic relational process where we enter a space together and we see what emerges. There are themes, like I've just drawn out, that are um, common amongst people, but everyone is really so different. And it's really, really not linear. So yes, I can have a vague roadmap as though there are steps, but it's not dun, 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 and then I graduate. Well, I think that's very, you know, our culture really likes that, but it's a kind of false sense, false sense of certainty. But I, there, there are still a lot I can say to answer your question. 
To add on to the difficulties, it's a family role thing. Now, not everyone, but what I see as a repetitive pattern is a lot of highly sensitive and intense people get into particular family roles within their family. I don't know if your family, like everyone has like a role in the family. Some people are like the clown, some people are the mediator, some people are the problem solver. It's fine. We all have these family roles. As, but a healthy family system, in a healthy family system, these roles should be flexible. Like, okay, I'm, I have a tendency towards, I like problem solving or I'm funny. But if I'm always just a clown and no one takes me seriously, that's problematic. If I'm just a problem solver and no one tries to solve my problem, that's problematic. So what I find is a lot of sensitive and intense people, because of their capacity and their sensitivity, they get parentified a lot. So the word parentified, let's say falsified, parentified, they become like a little parent, a little grown up from a young age. Um, they could be doing physical parentification. They could be, sorry, they could be subject to physical parentification where they are running errands, taking care of their younger siblings, doing all the shopping, taking people to dentist, da da da. Or they are emotionally parentified, which is more common where in a very subtle way, they become the family counselor, the family therapist, the one that everyone goes to. It's not usually not. Sometimes, yes, they're alcoholic and abusive parents. Sometimes it's not because anyone is being horrible. It's unconscious. They just automatically took on that role because they can. So there is that part to it. And then a lot of time, a lot of the time, what I help people do is to undo the trauma caused by her parentification um, and reclaiming their life. You know, they often take on that role and they find themselves stretched really thin and their own needs and identities get overshadowed from a young age. So they could reach middle adulthood and get very confused. Who I am? What do I really want? Who am I outside of taking care of my family? So I'm helping them to find their own aspirations, their desires, ability to care for themselves again, um, setting healthier boundaries with their parents or their siblings. And it's, it doesn't mean it, it's not cold. It's not cold to set boundaries. Healthy boundaries actually bring you closer because then you nurture your own growth. And then when you're with the other person, you don't feel like you're there to rescue them. You're genuinely enjoying a time together. So it's a, it's a process of redefining their role within the family and acknowledging that they themselves also deserve the same care and respect and attention that they've been giving to everyone else. Midlife crisis and existential crisis is a big theme that people come to me for. Many people reach a certain age and realize, I don't want to be a software engineer or my job is boring. Why am I doing this? I don't want to be an accountant. I'm only doing this because it's secure and that's what my parents wanted me to do. And they've set aside their own passion and interest and dimming that radiant intensity that so few the creativity and ambitions that they originally had. So this is a process of unpeeling a lot of society and family pressure. And to help them do that is to guide them to relearn how to play without being a perfectionist but embracing the messy middle the imperfect the unpredictable things and to reclaim a childlike sense of wonder um modality